Hello everyone, today we will implement our damage formula in our game. Last video we talked about different damage formulas of different games and we talked about how we want to implement our damage formula. Uh, let's take a look real fast at the sheet. I inserted the stats that for enemy our flowers in the game will have and what our level 1 player will have. And we should do 9 damage with our lightning bolt because our lightning bolt has a skill percentage of 100%. Our simple skill where we base off every other skill off. And I have a, we have a more complex skill, our fireball with just 10 times the damage, which is quite a lot, but on the downside it has a 15 seconds cooldown while the lightning bolt just have a 1 second cooldown. So let's take a look how to implement this damage formula in our game with crit and everything. Currently it is in the game. When I press lightning bolt I have a 1 second cooldown at the lightning bolt and I do 9 damage. And when we check the, the exo sheet 9 damage is correct. It should be 13 damage for a crit because we always round down because we do integer rounding and the problem with that currently is that the base player at level one at my current configuration has a five percent crit rate so there is a chance that i will crit but it it is not a very high chance but let's play on luck here and for a second play our game Oh, there was a crit with a 13. So it is possible and we can fire or shoot our fireball and we crit it again, lucky us, with 135. And if we look, that's correct. And even 90 would one shot a flower. So we have a meter to farm those flowers. It's to fireball one and lightning bolt another one. There was a bug where where you got loot twice. I got loot twice because I killed two flowers, but there was a bug where you got loot twice by killing just one flower, which was a race condition when you casted skills more than one skill on one flower and this flower is about to die, then you had the ability to get loot twice. Um, this bug is fixed. Let's really talk really fast about this bug. Since when we cast a skill, the damage is done in the future because the surfer gets to know when this skill is casted, when the player actually presses the key basically. But the damage done to the flower is later. So there is a possibility that you can cast a spell on a flower while the flower HP is not empty because in the future, in one second or so, it will lose its health, but your skill casting goes through. So that's a way that we say this flower will get damage in the future, but has no health basically. And the fix for that is quite easy if you debugged it and found out that there is an issue, then you can go to on damage and just check again if the flower has health. The only thing that can happen now, which isn't an issue currently, is that the flower gets damage after its respawn. But the respawn time is 10 seconds and we don't have a damage skill that does damage 10 seconds in the future, so this shouldn't be an issue. So how, what, what did I change? Um, first of all, I implemented uh, the damage formula and you are able to crit. And for those who are following this channel uh, more, more intensely, you will recognize that the colors and everything of the damage has changed. So I wanted to show that there is actually a crit so that you know, the UI reflects that. Let's really fast take a look at what I needed to change on front and side, which is not a lot. Let's put this in a place where we can analyze that on its own. 
maybe a little bit to the right. The only thing I changed completely for, for this implementation, apart from moving variables around and uh, renaming them, is I have this component, damage display, and this now sets the color guardian instead of one color and has colors configurable for quit and non-quit. And I have a damage info now instead of an integer with just damage because I know we'll get is it a quit or not also. And then I configured this uh, text mesh pro here and that's it. That was the whole implementation for front end. Nothing more than that, really easy. Because front end on this regard is only listening to what the back end is saying, and it should be in most cases like that. On back end, it's actually not super crazy, but we first of all we need to configure the skills. So we have a skill stats class where we have cooldown, is the skill magic or not, because we have magic attack and magic defense, non-magic attack, non-magic defense. And the skill percentage, one is 100%. So our lightning bolt will have one and our fire bolt will have 10. So this is how we configure the skills. Then we have a table with that. And the table is basically a level table. And we have a function get stats. Currently, it just returns the, the configured value. But later, I want to make it easy for game designers to say, from level 1 to level 10, we then here interpolate the stats from 1 to 10. Or maybe the stats doesn't change from 10 to 11 or whatever. And so that you don't have to game design every le level of our skills. Let's say we want to have 100 levels, then you don't want to game design 100 levels individually. It's easier to make it with a formula. So that's why we not later won't directly access the, this table. We check the nearest uh, l values in the table and interpolate between them. That's why we added this in a function to prepare that to be easy implemented in the future. So we have this progression table and it is configured in game design skills. And there we see it. It's configured lightning bolt. Level one has a cooldown of one second. It's magic. Skill damage percentage of one. A fireball level 1, cooldown 15 seconds, is also magic, skill damage percent of 10. And this alone makes our game so much more interesting to play, because it's not that boring. Like, every time the same value. And this is public in a static variable. Because it's static configuration, it doesn't change. It's basically constant. We have this game design configuration. On the other side, we need to be able to have the player stats or the stats for the flower. And because it could be a prop, it could be an enemy, it could be a player, I named it entity stats because everything will have the stats basically at the end. We don't have this configurable. Currently, it's fixed. For the, for the flowers, that's totally fine. But later for the player leveling up and everything, these values need to change. But this is another feature. This is not part of this feature currently. So we have those stats and they are basically configurable. So the question is, where do I get those stats from? Uh, one second. So in the spawn configuration, when I spawn the flowers, then we configure the stats for each of the flowers that this spawn configuration spawns. We could have in the same range two different spawn configurations. One spawns flowers level 3 and one spawns flowers level 1. That would be totally possible within our currently game. 
But currently the for the props the spawn configuration says which entity stats. For now I think this is good enough. And we will see in the future if that actually holds true. And our spawn management will also save which entity has which stats. This is just the, the static stats of the entity. So this basically never changes. So we can add initialize, which is basically the initialization of the spawner. We can say each prop with this name will have this stats and they never change because there's just max HP in there. It's not HP. This is really just configuration. Um, for the player, it's currently uh, even easier because for the player, we, we just have default stats. This is where I get the player stats. Currently, since they don't change, it's easier to, to implement those features in chunks. And when, when I think about feature in changing stats for the player, I don't know how the game design will look like now. And if I prepare a big source code, just for for something which I'm not sure about, I most likely will have to refactor that source code. So just make it like that. Um, it would be better to have a function maybe that says get player stats and later you can fill this function with your game design. But uh, I was lazy here. I just said new entity stats and the default configuration luckily is exactly the configuration in our like in our excel sheet so we have the stats and everything configured and we basically feed it in our damage function which then calculates the damage and the calculation is basically the same as an excel we first check is it a magic skill if that's the case then we use m attack and M defense for attack and defense. If not, we use attack or defense. Then we calculate our attack def mod, which is exactly the attack def mod like in Excel, where we have this constant 1.5 attack over defense const, we multiply it by attack and divide by defense. Then we calculate the level difference. We calculate the level difference mod, same as an Excel. This is basically really much the same. And actually this is calculated wrong because the constant is 0, 5. So it's sometimes good to have a second look. So we fix that. Because flowers and players are currently just level one, this is always zero. That's why it doesn't, you don't see it in a test currently, but this was an issue. And then skill damage is calculated the same. Um, like an Excel, it's one plus the, the level difference mod multiplicate multiplied by the attack def mod, multiplied by the skill damage percent, multiplied by one plus bonus damage percent. In the last video where we talked about the damage formulas, we we talked a little a lot about that. So this is that. And then we do a roll. Um, it's basically we roll between zero and one hundred percent, but to have uh, the opportunity to be able to work with the decimal numbers, we also multiply by, uh, sorry, multiply by 1000. So the crit rate is one is equal to 100%. So one multiplied by 100 makes it from 1.00 to 100. And multiplied by 1,000 to give us some to give us some float point position because we do calculation with random with integer values. And the same with quit rate. Our current quit rate is 0 
that multiplied by 100 means 5, so 5 is 5%. That also multiplied by 1000 means 5000 and the other one is 100,000. And 5000 out of 100,000 should be 5%. That's how this works. It's important that this is lower because if, if this is lower equal, that means when we have a zero crit rate, that it is possible that this number will give zero and then it's zero lower equal zero, then we could crit with a 0% crit rate. In our game, there will never be a 0% crit rate, but if you want to have it in your game, that's good to keep in mind. Also, random next, it states in, in here very shortly, the min value, the inclusive lower bound. Inclusive means this number can actually occur. And the max value is the exclusive upper bound. That means the, the highest value is never included in random. So if you want to have a random number between zero and one, uh, zero or one, basically a coin flip, then you need to do zero or two because the two is exclusive and means the two will never be a, a value out of this random number generator. There, it will be just zero or one. You have to keep that in mind when, when you work with random next and use the integer part of it. The reason, if you're interested how, how this happens um, behind the scene, is the random number generator basically generates a double value between zero and one. And the double value never becomes one. And it multiplies that with your max value and always do integer rounding. So it always cuts off. So when, when it multiplies, let's say there's 0 0.999 as a result out of your random number generator, and it multiplies that with one, then the result is 0 0.999, and it always floors the values, always rounds down, which will result in zero. So when you do random next 0, 1, then this will always be zero because the max is inclusive and now you know mathematically why that is the case. Unnecessary assignment, yeah, that's true. Because I just use it here at the bottom. We have this formula implemented and it will give us it is a crit and it's a dimension or not. Quite simple. Then we, we save this value in our damage in future queue and the damage in future queue is then processed in the future. The reason for that is just animation fluff. The problem is, let's say my, my fireball takes a second to reach its destination and explode. When I cast the fireball, I, I let the backend know. This is a great opportunity for the backend to remove delay and, and basically trick around latency to make the game feel better than it actually is. And what we do, we will measure the round trip time of a message and we will remove this round trip time from the animation delay. And we, we calculate this, this network delay um, we will later use the network engine for that because the network engine provides this information really good. And we have this animation delay. Currently it's just fixed. Here it, we have to remove the network delay. But this gives us the opportunity to be able to do that. And this means no matter how your delay is, pretty much at the same time for the same spell, the damage number pops up at the same time. This is all there is to it. That's why we inform the backend and the damage is executed later. So we have this damage queue, we enqueue the damage in future. And the damage queue is quite simple. It has a tick basically like Unity update, where we remove the, the time from the wait duration and 
if the if this damage is actually zero in time so it, it should happen now it could be zero or less then we call wait on damage and this one's i think every 50 milliseconds or so let's check there should be an update here every 100 milliseconds yeah why not and this will call on damage and if you scroll over the function in on damage we fixed uh, the issue where uh, that property could give you loot um we will just do the damage do our calculation uh, and if the if the health is zero then we give loot so last hitting person gets loot which is not best because honestly you let's say you have a a prop which has a lot of health and you attack it or an enemy and there comes one player and does the last hit and gets the loot is absolutely bad but we will later implement that everyone who at least attacks the mob once will get loot which is also not a good implementation because I can see people attack every flower once and just chill around in the corner and get loot when other people come over and kill them. But this is on another table. There, there could be some difference like you have to do a hit a certain threshold of damage to get loot and everything. But I want to have this as simple implementation so everyone attack this once will get loot, but currently just last person. So the damage queue looks a little bit complicated if you're not used to um, working with locking. And normally, I we have mo we don't have much multi-threading in our backend because a lot of things are worked within a queue. But here, it actually can get multi-threaded. The reason for that is that the damage values comes from from our combat service via Redis and Redis in our case is uh, multi-threaded so they, they, we, we have to do multi-threading in our queue here and we have to sort it out. The only problem, now it's the funny part, the, the whole locking we do because of one simple problem and we could fix this problem but um, this is the most efficient way to do it, so why not do it that way? If when we loop through our list and the list gets modified with add or remove, then this loop will throw an exception. It doesn't matter if I do link for each or if I do for each or for int whatever. Um, if we modify the list then then this loop will have in this case in this implementation an exception that the list got modified or it will have an uh, unknown impact for example when i do a for loop uh, or traverse the list with a for loop and I, I delete something in the middle of the list the for loop might skip an entry or something which is bad and with this lock, we can basically uh, remove that. Normally what you do, uh, uh, you make a lock object like this. This is best practice. So yeah, let's do best practice. Why not? So we have this lock object and uh, what lock actually does, it does monitor enter. So there's a possibility to do that. It does monitor enter log object. And now it's different. One second. Oh, if I spell that correctly, then it's fine. It does monitor enter. And monitor enter just blocks till this thing gets freed again. But now imagine I forgot to do monitor exit, which is basically the other operation. 
If I forgot monitor exit, I have a deadlock in my backend and it's the worst thing that can happen. And to prevent most of the deadlocks, there's a simple way to in, in C sharp to do this lock because it enters here and it exits here, simple as that. But there are more complicated scenarios in multi-threading programming where you basically want to lock in one function and want to release the lock in another function. But we can make a video about multi-threading more with semaphores and everything. If you want that, leave a, uh, leave a comment on this video and I, I will make this happen for you. But currently we, we use lock, which is the simplest one. In, in this lock, for this lock object, only one function in only one thread, one execution, one function can be in there. So when, when, some, when the code is in here, this lock will block till this code access the lock. There are still ways to do um, deadlocks with lock. So often I, I read on the internet that lock is, you are not able to create deadlocks with that. That's not true. Because you can have uh, multiple lock objects, for example, like that. And I could lock with the other lock object and do here lock, lock object two. And do here lock lock object two and then one. This is a stupid example, but there are more complex things that could happen. It can happen that this gets the lock of lock object, and this update function gets the lock of lock object two. Then this function, this happens basically at the same time. This function waits for this function to complete and this function waits for this function to complete and that's what we call a deadlock. So even with lock there is there are possibilities to create deadlocks but not if you just use one lock object and that's what we do here. But this, this could be a more complex thing like this queue could be used by another one who creates locking and everything but it is actually possible. So when we add something to the queue, this loop can't run because this loop is also in a lock. So adding won't destroy this execution function. Then I will release the lock and then I loop over it and here I get which damages will get executed which is great and then I loop over the damages that get executed. This basically creates a copy of the list where, where everything is zero or, or lower. The reason why I do a copy because when I list or run over it and I want to remove entries from it, I again run over the the list and remove entries, which there is there is a way to, to do that in, in this case because um, I, I'm looping and removing in the same function. So I could manipulate the i variable depending on what I do at the bottom of the list, but it's easier that way. I just clone the list and loop through the actually damages that should happen. Then I call on wait damage and then I do remove. The reason the, why I don't do that, which might be the, the most straightforward way to have the lock over everything, which is fine. One reason is I can't do a, a async await within a lock. And the other reason is I don't want to I don't want to block um, the lock as longer than I need. But if the weight would work, I would create a lock outside because monitor enter and exit actually takes some time. So this is uh, in performance, but 
in performance so we don't need to uh, optimize here but i can't do async await anyway in a lock so this is it about lock and about this queue why this queue look, looks more complicated than it actually needs to be and yeah then then the damage is happening in on damage and then we publish the damage we publish the damage message and the combat service will send the message to the player so own currently only the player itself see this, sees the number popping up this is it basically we cast a spell we calculate the damage we add it to the damage queue damage queue gets processed gets sent back to the player and we got this great looking ui there's one thing which I fast want to implement, which I didn't implement just to show that the calculation is on par with, with Excel. Oh, I just started debugging. Let's stop that. Which is damage variance. It's very boring to always see the same number. So we said we want a damage variance. Final Fantasy VII has a damage variance of 7%. Let's take 5% or 10%. Let's take 10%. I think 10% is good. So we go to our damage calculation and we add damage variance. We basically could also do something like that. Calculate is crit. And then add crit damage. Yeah, the other one I keep. And now we want to add damage variance, which is quite simple to do. Since we are working with integers, uh, let's first of all calculate how much variance there is. The maximum variance, which is basically damage multiplied by, uh, let's make this a constant. Upload max damage variance. Let's say it's 10% for now. Then we multiply that the, the current damage with the damage variance and convert it back to int. For 9, this will be 0. So we only do something if damage variance is greater 0. Uh, that doesn't make sense and then we generate a random number in variance it's actually random next zero it could be zero then you do full damage and it could be the full damage variance and like i said this is exclusive but we want to include the max value so we add plus one and then we do damage minus equal damage variance and that's everything we have to do to have a 10 percent damage variance let's see if it's working this is basically live coding now i didn't prepare that in the damage formula video i said that i want to have damage variance to not have the boring values and Why not implement that live if it's just a small, easy feature like that? Unity always needs to compile because I copy over the, the common library for which is shared between backend and frontend. And Unity always wants to recompile them, even though the library hasn't changed. Just because of the date-time change in in the metadata of the of the DLL or whatever. So let's log in real fast and see if we have a damage variance. The fireball is 
should be doing 90 damage, so the variant should be 81 to 90. Let's see, 81, this is still the hardest punishment. Lightning Bolt has a damage variance of 0, because 9 division by 10 is 0 0.9, and like I said, we always round down. So it would be very wise to, for debugging purposes, have this fireball have a lower cooldown than 15 seconds. Let's check that again, and if it's again 81, then something isn't working correctly, because that's not how random works. Yes, we use damage variance, which is here the value, and if I give it a correct name, then this problem would have never happened because I would have seen that this is the maximum damage variance. And since I'm here, uh, calculate damage variance. And you also saw the impact of having good variable names in your source code. They mean a lot. So we test it real fast and then this is it for the video. So we get blocking fireball eighty six. Great. This is still nine nine nine. Oh, I quit it. Eighty four. Let's just do one more and see what will happen. Eighty four, which is sad. Yeah, what I can test it around still more, but I think it's working. And this is it for today. I wish you all a great weekend. I thank my Patreon, Julian, obviously. And obviously, spread the word, share, share this channel with your friends. Have a good day. Bye.